This really came together very, very fast um, because Olga was getting ready to interview Laura Sibilia, Vermont State Representative, and also Becca Bellin, our senator, who uh, just notified us she has 102 temperature and really regrets she can't come tonight. Uh, I'm sure she'll be watching on the live stream. Uh, and she was about, Olga was about to interview them both to talk about community media on WKVT Green Mountain Mornings last Thursday. Correct. And um, the show was abruptly canceled and we were talking and thought, why don't we do the interview anyway and invite some other people and bring in the public and have a wider forum about community media, um, including the Commons, the Reformer, uh, and some of our radio stations. We're hoping maybe this could be the first in a series so we can start inviting other people, um, different people from the media. Um, our panelists today were able to come on short notice over a holiday weekend. Um, and so I thank all of you. And uh, we would love to hear from everybody in the audience with questions at the end of the panel today. Um, anyone with um, ideas on how to support community media, we want to hear from you. And I just want to quickly introduce our panelists and our moderator, Olga Peters, uh, senior writer uh, with the comments and also former uh, host of Green Mountain Mornings. And uh, Green Mountains Mornings was one of our longest running, most popular local shows. And we would really like to hear ideas on how to keep local radio alive and local news live. Um, we also have Jim Maxwell, who is one of our favorite media lawyers here at BCTV. Uh, I'm a board member at BCTV and he's worked on a lot of our contracts. He also does art talk on WVEW. Uh, That's we the key thing. That's the main thing. <laughs> Listen to art talk. It's Fridays, Fridays between four, four and five. <laughs> Uh, Melanie Winters, uh, who is news editor of The Reformer, and she actually just edited something I wrote last week for a nonprofit, so thank you. <laughs> Did a beautiful job. And um, we, we know that uh, The Commons is a nonprofit and The Reformer is a for profit, but these days both uh, for profit and nonprofits are struggling, and we want to encourage support of subscriptions for both and membership for both. Um, Laura Sibilia, our Vermont State Representative, who has been amazing at trying to defend the state of Vermont um, in terms of very difficult challenges with companies like Comcast and the telecom industry. Um, Comcast has recently, in conjunction with the Federal Communications Commission, tried to uh, challenge the status quo in a way that could really threaten our funding at BCTV, and so we're going to be talking about that too today. Um, Randy Holhut, Randy, <laughs> um, he is the deputy managing editor of The Commons. And how long have you been at The Commons? I've been at The Commons for eight years. I've done two tours at The Reformer. And at The Reformer. And <laughs> so he can speak to both profit and nonprofit papers, although. <laughs> and um, uh, almost 40 years in media. Yes. Um, actually, the combined experience of people on this panel is probably over 300 years. <laughs> and we're all very young, so that's... Yes. That's why I go to yoga regularly. Yes. <laughs> and uh, also CORE, who is our executive director at BCTV, um, is because of CORE racing around uh, to try to set up this panel and get this room and help us with the invites and get the technology for the live stream that this is happening today. So thank you, CORE. Um, I'm going to take it to you, Olga. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leah. And thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Because as Leah said, we, we uh, brought this panel together in just a few days. Uh, so we weren't really sure if anyone would show up or not. Uh, and the size of the audience really is a testament to how passionate people are about local journalism and um, community media. So thank you for being here. And I do want to also reiterate our thanks to CORE and everyone at BCTV for making this happen, because without them, we wouldn't have the live stream and we wouldn't have this discussion tonight. So thank you. Um, I want to start with Laura Sibelia. You know, what brought us here, all here tonight, is our concern about community media and the community having access to its own news and what, what it needs to know about itself. Um, and while there have been some changes on the landscape recently, this has been an ongoing discussion for a long time, but you have some specific concerns with connectivity and the First Amendment, and um, let's start with you right there with those concerns. Sure, sure, thank you, and thank you for putting this together. Um, I think this is exactly 
um, what we need to be doing. I think there needs to be an urgency around conversations for um, community, uh, the press, connectivity, how we access our information, how we share information. Um, so uh, many of you may know I, uh, I represent areas to the west um, uh, of the county and some of them are really very disconnected um, uh, from, the, from the internet. And they're, at this point, they're unable to access government services, education, uh, public safety, um, and we're starting to see um, problems even with uh, the landline telecommunications. Um, this, this is challenging. This is um, really not good. And so uh, I have been increasing my efforts uh, during my legislative session time on ha and learning, uh, always learning, uh, and I'm happy to be here tonight learning how can we do better, how can we um, accelerate connecting folks. And <clears throat> it's, it, this problem seems to be escalating. Uh, and it, there's a, there are a number of junctures that um, are coming together. Uh, many of you also know me from uh, my day job where I work on uh, economic development <coughs> for the county. We've just finished a five-year plan doing that. And uh, we had a pretty profound, um, in this room actually, I think uh, we had a, during one of our community meetings, someone talk about uh, connectivity has been elevated at all of our meetings, people being able to access services, access information. And uh, we had someone here say, I don't know if that's a great thing because the more connected people are, it seems like the more isolated they are, hmm. which interesting. is interesting. Um, you know, and we hear a lot about, um, we're starting to hear a lot about Americans being lonely and losing their senses, sense of community the more connected we become. So <clears throat> those things um, combined with what we see happening nationally, um, the overt attacks on our press, the changing model of information delivery, which you know many of you have been living for many years and seeing happen. Um, those things, I feel like they're coming together in a way that, um, as I said, it feels urgent to me. And this feels like the right place to start having these conversations. It's at the community level, it is at the state level, um, and starting to have discussions about how are we going to share information? How are we going to keep each other informed? Um, these systems are changing, and so how are we going to adapt? So this is a question, I'll, I'll start with Laura, but I'm curious about the entire panel's response to this is, you know, just to play devil's advocate, why should we care whether or not we have a healthy, robust community news system, whether it's radio or print or TV? With the Facebook and everything, why do we really need it? So and so, my guess is we'll get a pretty consistent answer. I would guess, <laughs> but you know, obviously, um, for me, I feel like a lack of knowledge totally fans fear. Fear fans bad behavior, um, and you know, combined with um, what I would not consider to be great civics education in our schools, you know, those things are really not coming together well. Um, so I think it's really important for us to think about how we can communicate to each other what's happening in a way that we trust. Core, what about what about you? What do you think is important about a, why should we care about a community ecosystem of, of media? Well, I guess what I've felt re remarkable about our region is it's really sort of different than what we're seeing globally. Globally, media is consolidating. We've been seeing that for years. And, um, and people are, are getting their news from their social media feeds, and that's just, and instead of saying, oh, I'm gonna subscribe to this publication because I trust this publication, or this publication reflects my views or whatever, but in this area, I just think, um, partially because I think we're geographically isolated from the population center of Vermont, and, there, and therefore we don't have major news outlets mm -hmm. that are covering what's going on here. And partially I think it's just the personality of this area. Um, BCTV was the first public access station founded in the state, 1975. That was before most of the country had public access. And that was because people here in Brattleboro wanted to watch the Brattleboro Select Board meeting 
um, they wanted to watch that. Mm -hmm. They want to know what's going on. They wanted governmental transparency, and they were going to use this technology to do it. So, um, and I, expanding out from that in a circle, um, I think that the residents here, Wyndham County, want to be able to share their views. That's why we have I Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the Commons. That's why we have WVEW. That's why the reformer has lasted. That is why um, all of these media outlets have, you know, have lasted this long in a time when there's just media consolidation everywhere else. Um, and I get that over and over again when I walk around as a representative of our station where people are saying, you know, I watch it all the time. <laughs> Maybe they're watching online and that's fine. Um, but, you know, it's surprising how much people want to stay connected using these media sources that they trust because they know us. <laughs> they know, you know, we are, we are you. We are everyone, right? And, um, and so I think that that's a strength that we have. Our isolation is kind of a weakness, but in some ways, you know, in terms of problem solving for ourselves, we could look at it as a strength. I think it's also the the uh, how the media is viewed and used. Uh, the 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 conglomeration of media tends to, in my view, decouple people who want to use the media for uh, individual political um, community reasons and makes the media more a mass. You know, it, 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 people can use media purely for the couch and a bag of chips. Um, which we all love now and then. But media can also be used for, and I think when you, you put your finger on it about Wyndham County in this area, I'm sure other parts of the state, uh, the, the participants are activists. And I mean activists not in the sense of, well, not just political activists. I mean activists in terms of how I want to communicate with people the information I need on a daily basis. How do I feel I function in the community um, if I don't have some easy access to connectivity with the other folks, and it's not simply just a matter of, well, what am I seeing today? What's, what's being given to me today? It's really a more active participation, and that's why I think we have these local outlets and these local you know, media opportunities, is because there's that need to use media in that way. Um, Melanie, what are what are your thoughts? Um, I'd actually like to add a little bit to what you said and what you said about connectivity. There's actually some research that shows civic activism goes down mm -hmm. when local media outlets close. You can rely on Facebook, but Facebook, if you are familiar with the algorithms, only show you what you already want to know. They're not going to show you what you, what you don't know that you know don't know. <laughs> you know, and that's what local media is for. Right. But all you know? the, all this is moot if you don't if you can't get the internet. And That's true. Wyndham County has among the worst quality of internet outside of the Northeast Kingdom. There are still many dead zones for cell phones in Brattleboro. You just go up to go up to Western Avenue and you'll lose your cell signal. Uh, the phone the phone company has traditionally not invested in in, in high speed service in, in Vermont for years. You. You see all the commercials on television about all the wonderful things that you can get with, with uh, from Comcast, from from Verizon, and I just scream at the television, not in Vermont, because mm -hmm. you can't get any of this in Vermont. Uh, they, our providers still think 20 megs of uh, of download services is perfectly adequate high-speed internet. So, so Randy, given some of the challenges that local media is facing right now, um, what do you think is the biggest thing that needs to change? Is it internet X? If you could name one thing, internet, funding, what? Well, obviously from the position we're in at the Commons, funding. <laughs> but that's the easy answer. We all want more. We all, we all want more resources to do our job. But the resources that say the reformer had when I came came to town in 1989. No local newspaper is going to ever have that again. So that's a bygone era. Yeah. No, there used to be a Bellows Falls Bureau. They had three people up there. There used to be a, a West River Valley correspondent. You, uh, there used to be uh, three editors in, in the daytime, two at night, two sports people, a photographer, all the people in the composing room and the mechanical departments. The reformer was a major employer in Brattleboro. That's gone. So, so what needs to happen now to ensure a healthy news ecosystem? 
What needs to happen? People need to support it. Because the original sin of the internet was giving the news away. Mm -hmm. yep. And I remember, uh, 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 no one, the publishers at the time did not know what to do with the internet. They f saw it as an add-on, as a promotion. Eh, it might turn into something in 1995. But it took only a couple of years to, 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 for online viewing and readership to become a thing. That is such a good point because um, what I have seen in my employment uh, in this local area is journalism, to have really good journalism, especially like a spotlight team or an investigative journalism, you need a lot of people. It's very human resource intense and yet one of the fastest ways to save money, if that's your goal, is to cut people. Um, Jim, mm -hmm. how about you? What is the one thing you think needs to change right now? To, to help local media? Uh, well, uh, first one thing, I, I didn't want to misrepresent where my area may be on this panel. I'm not a media lawyer. Um, I have, um, I'm an attorney, and I've helped CORE and BCTV with contracts, and in, in many ways the, uh, the issues that BCTV is facing, the media law is extremely complicated, there are communications acts and FCC, but it, it, it may in the end come down to how the contract is going to be dealt with and how it's going to be enforced or fought or however that's going to work, so just, mm -hmm. just uh, to clarify that. Thank you. Um, that also helps me to skirt the question because I'm not really sure I've got a, a good answer as to what needs to happen now. I do know that um, the, uh, the news gathering or journalistic part uh, of local media, I, I'm not sure how that comes back if, ever, if it ever does. I think that the, the, but the word connectivity means more to me than simply what's you know, what's happening newsworthy. It has more to do with how am I working hour to hour, day to day in my community, in my, with my radio, with my TV, with my, you know, um, the, the sense of, particularly, I can't help but be panoramic about this. I think in this day and age, we're constantly going back to founding documents, founding ideals, founding whatever. And um, th there's nothing more foundational then um, Ben Franklin said it was the U.S. mail was the most important thing. What does the U.S. mail accomplish? It accomplishes me talking to you. It accomplishes a, a communicative ability, a communicative device. So I think it's maybe it's in the communicative part more than in the straight journalism that we're going to find some sort of a, a pathway. But, I, you know, I can't say that I've got any vision. You know. How about you, Cor? Yeah, I'm... It's tough because um, I think you all know, or many of you know um, in this room, that BCTV's had this funding that was provided for through the 1984 Cable Act, which allowed um, cable companies to pass through small percentage of their subscriber fees to support public access stations all over the country. And in Vermont, we have 25 stations. That's how small and hyper-local these stations are. Um, and what's been great about that funding source for us is that we've been able to, we are locally supported, and yet at the same time we're not pulling from the same um, funding sources of the businesses and nonprofits that, um, that everybody else is. And that we've been able to use that funding source to kind of leverage um, mm -hmm. what, municipal, what we can offer to municipalities and nonprofits and individuals in terms of their free speech rights and getting the word out and covering meetings. Um, and, um, and so that's been, um, that's been a real strength of the organization. And um, because that source of funding is now threatened by the FCC, um, it's hard to say, you know, what could possibly replace that. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to give, I want to ask a follow-up question that I have to give Chris Grotke of I Broughtabro credit for. You know, he, he raised with me when we were talking earlier today, he said, you know, is it the FCC that is part of the problem here with what BCTV is facing, or is it the fact that so many people, you mentioned cable cutting, you know, so many people are starting to leave cable in general like where's that pressure where's the bigger pressure yes well it's it's the same thing which is that funding source it was going to decline anyway as people cut the cord um, and move to the internet um, the cable act 
did not apply to internet service providers or to satellite providers for that matter. So as, te as telecommunications technology has moved on, the funding mechanism has not moved on. But that was going to be more of a gradual decline and not a cliff. Um, so both are true. Okay, thank you. And you know, if I had the answer, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'd just be going off doing it. <laughs> uh, Melanie, what about you? What do you think is the one thing that needs to change? Um, Less tangible than perhaps what other people are talking about. Just a, a perhaps a, a greater understanding that the news does not come cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, people have salaries. You know, we 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 had, people have to get paid. You know, you need staff. You need the the human resources that you mentioned. Um, and you know, Randy had mentioned people are getting used to having everything for free now over the internet, but they don't realize that the stuff they're getting for free, others are regurgitating from those of us who do the work. Yeah. yeah, somebody wrote that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I think there needs to be a better public understanding of that. But I don't know how to go about that. Laura. You know, I think we really, people need, to, we need to communicate that the old models are not working anymore. Um, you can't uh, expect them to work for much longer. And I think start helping people understand what that means. Mm-hmm. So a sense of urgency will cause people to act. And so I think helping people understand, I think, you know, there's been a lot of attention um, around this issue of uh, BCTV. Um, I think people need to imagine what that means if BCTV goes off the air. What does it mean when, you know, we no longer have local personalities um, being interviewed on Green Mountain Mornings? Where can you hear them? Right. And, you know, how will we replace that? and who is going to come together to solve that problem. Randy and I were talking the other day, and I want to throw it over to Randy. You know, I was, I, again, playing devil's advocate because that's my favorite part of my job, is, um, you know, so often journalism has had a number of separations of church and state, business from editorial, advertising from journalism, uh, municipalities from news outlets. For, given how the landscape has changed so much do we need to strengthen those separations of church and state or do we need to let some of them go like take subsidies from the state i mean do we need to go that far well to to quote one of our former secretaries of state deb markowitz in her favorite answer to a query it was her favorite answer <laughs> it depends <laughs> it depends on the situation it depends on what is being asked uh, using avatorials and passing them off as as a editorial copy, you know, not mm -hmm. making it clear that this this piece of of this the video press releases is, is ubiquitous on television. You see a lot of these kind of canned reports that pop up in different markets, and the only thing that changes is the voiceover on them. You know, the, the companies that send out 90 seconds worth of video and then a local reporter puts their voice over from the script that's provided to them and they, and voila, there's a story about uh, uh, about something. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's local news, but it's not. Right. And that's the kind of thing that you'd, you'd be fighting against, of, of interference by by advertisers in, in, in the editorial product. But in terms of working together, we think I think we, you know, our, our, our community paper. We're you know, we're a nonprofit, the Commons is, but we also sell advertising, and I think we work with advertisers in giving them a, a, a venue to communicate their information to uh, to consumers all over the county. The most read part of our newspaper are those little boxes on page one. Those little bitty boxes, <laughs> and people read the, read them uh, and compete for the spots every week. If you provide the service, people will support will support that. And uh, you know, with underwriting on BCTV, I'm sure that uh, with 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 core with with your, your underwriters, you go to a store that, uh, or a business that, that supports BCTV or, or Railroad Savings Loan, which supports all of us. <laughs> So yeah, they, they get they get a lot of brownie points in the community for for uh, for supporting uh, community activities. That's the sort of thing that's uh, you know acceptable. 
buying stories and paying to play. That's something, no. No matter how dire fun things gets. Yeah, that's a that's a line I personally don't ever yeah. want to cross. And, yeah. and but it's happened in in bigger papers than ours, who who of of advertisers have gotten a little too much, too much value for their money. Um, I want to ask Melanie. You know, Randy talked about the common status as a nonprofit, mm -hmm. with the reformer being a for profit paper. Um, are you seeing some of the challenges that you're facing similar or different? Does that does that start? Uh, well, I, I can't speak to to what the the commons challenges are. I, I know, like in terms of, um, we see it on Facebook all the time. You know, we have a paywall that goes up. People are allowed three free views, and then a paywall goes up, and they get mad. Mm -hmm. and they get mad. They're like, it's on Facebook. It should be free. And that's what I was talking about before. People need to understand. No, this is not free. You know, I mean, they have a different funding mechanism than we do, um, but. It, you still need to pay for the resources and the staff and all of that. It's, um, that's, I think that's probably the biggest challenge is just people understanding that um, a lot goes into putting a, a, together a newspaper and, and BCTV and all the things that they do. Part of it, I think, is letting, um, is uh, the strategy of what's the value added? What is, the, what is the value that we're adding as the reformer? What's the value that we're adding as the commons, as BCTV, as WVEW, to understand that your $300 you know, underwriting, right? What is the value added? I think all of us, um, and maybe some goal would be to really strategize what is it that this, that this local media group, whether it's a paper, a radio station, a TV station, what is the value that's being added to people who are participants as auditors as well as as broadcasters in that whole endeavor and I, and and you know I I guess the thing that really worries me is the uh, when I use the word decoupling you know what the FCC what the proposed um, rule change means is in the service of profit um, the conglomeration or the, the large organization had its natural tendency is to draw in and get dense and get you know, wealthy, and uh, it's it's a it's an example in small of what a lot of the um, a, a lot of people outside the cities um, complain about the cities being concentrated and so forth. And so, you find an FCC rule like this seems to me to be specifically geared toward jettisoning, jettisoning, jettisoning the margins, mm -hmm. so that and that's what's happening in the middle is a homogenized voice. It's a homogenized uh, consumption of media. So, so my view of this would be uh, resist. <laughs> One reason we exist is to resist. One reason we exist as local media is to continue to be local media, no matter but, what. But if you remember, you know, all the way back to the enact, enact, that rule being enacted, the cable companies have fought this. All the way back to the good old days of Terry Ray Gould and, and, and Warner Cable fighting against the against Right, this but role. this was the public good that the state said as a franchising authority if you're going to come into our state you, you, you in exchange to... for this rights of way, you're going to be giving this public benefit, mm -hmm. which is which is community TV stations. And, and, and I think that goes back to what Melanie was saying. We forget that news is a public, yes, it needs to make money because people need to be paid and everything like that, but that it is a public service and that these are public airwaves and... Um, this is part of our democracy. It's not an add-on. And the funny thing is, cable is the last medium that actually has this requirement. Hmm. The over-the-air broadcasting used to have requirements for for public service broadcasting. That's right. that you used to have to keep logs about how much public. You, you, you still do. You still do. Yeah. Does any, when was the last time the FCC ever looked at came in to look at uh, the public file? Here locally. Yeah. Right around the time when BEW. Yeah, go up yeah, there. Go up to the mic, please. Everyone, this is uh, Pete Case, also known as Fish, head of uh, Fish Hook Communications. So the um, radio is still under. They, they can they can take a program that will cover these these needs, which are nice and neat, and an affidavit will take care of it. Um, when when I ran a local radio station here, we, we opted not to subscribe to these services. We opted to put on programming such as live and local. 
such that I can, I, I swear to God, there's got to be at least everybody that I've worked with at that radio station's in this room right now. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, so we, we had acted live and local, which, uh, took up a three hour block of time in the middle of the morning, which was, uh, hosted by Steve West, Chris Lenoir. Then while Chris had it, we changed it to Green Mountain Mornings. Chris then handed it off to Olga. So these were the ways that we did that. And then within my own morning program, I conducted and interviewed and we would log them or we put them in the public file. Um, the last time the FCC rolled through and checked them out was when um, the, uh, what was it, uh, Brattleboro Free Radio? Yes, Radio nope. Free Brattleboro. Radio Free Brattleboro. That was a decade ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you asked. There's your answer. More though. than a decade. I, so. I still had to fill out paperwork, though. I, and I, I and, and it's kind of vestigial job. parts of the, of the, of the, of the, before the Communications Act, not the end of the, the Fairness Doctrine in the 80s. The Communications Act of 1996, when you really had to keep a look on that, yep. and the FCC really came to check out your 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 public file to see if you were actually programming, at, and those wonderful words of the original Communications Act of 1934 in the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Right. So I can tell you now that I don't know what the requirements are for newspaper um, to fulfill those, but I know that they're there. I don't know what the um, requirements are for, for what CORE does, but I know that they're there. Um, speaking on behalf of radio, it, is all, it is all now has to be uh, documented and uploaded. Now, who's looking at it realistically? Probably nobody, unless it's not time stamped properly, and that's just a way for the FCC to then go and find a radio station or give them their window in which to, to fix the issue. But quarterly reports are filed. So there is, but it, and, and your point is not lost on the point you're trying to make. It means nothing. It's paperwork that needs to be filed to satisfy the need of a government. Right, and, and I think uh, Pete kind of pointed to the fact that Green Mountain Mornings and before, in its early incarnation, Live and Local, existed was because of commitments that were happening at the community level. Well, let me let me just interrupt. It, 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 it was an easy way to serve those commitments, but the community was always first with those commitments and a way to serve, to have nonprofits to come in and talk about issues and things. And, and um, one of the things that sprang from that was uh, something that both Chris Lamois and I had hosted uh, was called a call to action, and they were often here where we would pick a, a specific topic and just do some some laser laser beam type focus on that and how to resolve those issues. And that's the kind of community stuff that that gets out there and really really gets at the crux of what the problem is. You know, opioid addiction was the first one that I think that we did, um, and and that was that was a really big one at a, at a high time. We we covered. Um, cyber attacks, we covered panhandling, we, we covered them all, and these are the issues when you get down into local media that we were able to do. Now, now we did that under the guise of a for-profit mm -hmm. organization, so that made it a little easier, but um, when we're dealing with these kind of situations that we have right now, um, we have to deploy a little something I like to call air, airport, airplane rules, and you've heard, you've heard me talk mm -hmm. about this, and okay. that's you can't, uh, one of the things they tell you is to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can turn and help anybody else. And that's, that's what everybody has to do is they have to kind of take a look at it. We've all become complacent because it's easy to become complacent. I know. I just went through 25 years of complacency. And when I emerged from that, um, I, have, uh, I have developed something that I call controlling the fall. And, and that's where we are now. Yeah. I, I want to come back to that, but before I do, Pete, um, I think Laura had a point she wanted to make. I just want to catch it before we move on. Well, I, I think we have a room full of media people. Is that correct? Is that There's a lot most? of media people mm -hmm. out there, yes. Have? Yeah. Have? <laughs> Former or present. Any, uh, anybody meet with the FCC chairman when he came to Vermont uh, this summer? Was anyone invited to that meeting? Not invited. How many people knew that the FCC chairman was here this summer? When you say here, you mean Vermont? In Vermont, yes. Yeah. So how many people think that's a problem? <laughs> I think that's a big problem. Um, and, you know, that unfortunately is something that uh, I think we're going to have to wait for an election to solve. But <clears throat> right now that's 
uh, one of the complicating factors that um, we're dealing with. So that yes. was actually a curiosity question, one of the things that I wanted to learn mm -hmm. um, here, because I, I thought that was actually outrageous uh, yes. to have that type of person here uh, without public um, engagement, particularly with the media. Mm -hmm. um, this will be a question for everyone, but I'm going to start with Pete. You know, you talked about controlling the fall and the airplane rules. So where do you think this community needs to be putting its resources now, you know, to work with a, a laser beam focus to start changing the dial? Well, you know, I mean, uh, obviously, the uh, b between the commons and the work CORE does and, and the work that, that VEW does, and I know that VEW um, does, you know, a, a lot more of kind of a, a, of a musicality kind of a service for the community, but there is a way for them to get involved a little bit deeper into the conversation, perhaps um, a, a talk show that serves the community is, is the easiest way to do it, but how do you get people to listen? Randy pointed out one, uh, one thing about the small boxes on the front that, that capture the attention. The same could be said for the small boxes on the Reformer. They're easy to look at because they take three seconds to read and you can get all the information you want in three seconds. That's the world that we have to adapt everything to these finite amounts of time that we have in order to capture somebody's attention and then hoping that within that first three to five seconds that we can then get them to delve, maybe invest another 10 seconds and everything's gotta be done in 10 second blocks of time to, to get them to read an entire article. And, and, and you can blame social media for a lot of that. Why do people go to social media for these kind of things? Cause, and and uh, Steve and I have had many conversations about uh, and, and Randy and I and Olga and I, uh, pretty much everybody in this room have had conversations <laughs> about people just not reading beyond the headlines. You know, X, Y, Z, and, and that's just what it is. And it, it doesn't matter that there's the rest of the alphabet is in the article below. X, X Y, and Z is all we care about because that was those were the big bold letters. Right. You know, so that's, um, I'm not sure I answered your question or if I just tangent a little bit there. You tangent a little that's bit. That's what I do. But. <laughs> <All right. laughs> But I think you did point on, you know, partly one thing that may need to change is the model about how we deliver and and produce news. So when I talk about complacency, and, and that is what I'm talking about now, I, it's not to say that we need to sacrifice our, our beliefs and our uh, uh, around how we produce the news, um, which is why when when I worked for that radio station that I created a longer form talk show that would allow somebody to jump from my program that would allow a two to three minute interview to jump over to Steve, Chris, or yourself and, and have a longer form where you could really get into it and, and to be able to cross promote that across the media. You know, mm -hmm. So if you want to read more about that, pick up the reformer or the commons. If you want to see it live, if you're a visual person, tune into BCTV. Um, you know, the, uh, the radio is a great way to hear it long form as well. Uh, getting people trained to it's, it's odd. We live in an on-demand world, which is as, as was touched upon here, um, yet podcasting in this area doesn't seem to be as important as it really could be. Mm -hmm. So some sort of a webcasting format that would allow that. And I, and I, think, I think CORE and, and, and VEW and, and all, all media outlets that, that are represented here today have a responsibility to kind of recreate that model even here locally where you can just access that stuff anytime you want it and an on-demand and an on-demand platform um we'll have question and answer in about 10 minutes thank you um so who wants to jump on what where we should we put our resources to make sure that we have a healthy news ecosystem well, what are the resources? Yeah, that was yeah, exactly resources. the question I was just going to say. I'm leaving that up to you guys. Well, I did think about that earlier about church and state and so forth. Um, it is really interesting. We sometimes uh, forget, though, that if if there are going to be subsidies, then there are taxes. I mean, it always comes back to the money. It just It's just a matter of where it's being funneled from and being funneled to. And I, I, I always would think that it's better for... Um, for uh, us as, as media people to be going after our, uh, perhaps with a joint strategy, but you know, finding ways to fund what we're doing without relying on the state or the church, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> to help us with that. Um, um, 
No, I think what, what Fish is talking about in terms of understanding more about how media is being used is, is a real good starting point for strategizing how we remain important in people's lives in the community. And one thing is, do people live nationally or do they live locally? I think we live in a place where people do live more locally than they agree. do in I Fairfield agree. County. You know, in Fairfield County, you go home, you, you put your, everything you do is somewhere else. We live where we do. And so I think as, as media, we need to recognize that um, that's the value added. We're here helping people live locally. So that's part of it. But I think the, the resources, that's kind of a conundrum for me. I'm not really sure how, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. We, we have media outlets here that win awards over and over again for specific journalists, for, for service to the community, for service for news. And, and that is something that I think just sort of gets sort of washed by, uh, to, the, to the wayside often. Um, and, it, and it is something that, it's not that you have to focus on it and pat yourself on the back and, and tout yourself as being the best, but it, it should be mentioned sometimes, touted sometimes, that, you know what, if you don't pick up a copy of The Reformer, if you don't pick up a copy of The Commons, if you don't tune into BCTV, you're really missing something. So, I was just going to suggest something that we need, maybe we need to toot our own horn a little bit more. Well, I was going to ask that. I was also going to say, well, what do you need from your community right now? Because this is a two-way street. I mean, there are things that journalism needs to do better <laughs> and media needs to do better, but we also... The, we have a community, and it's a two-way street. Just, I, you know, I'll tell you how... I experience local news, and I don't see the boxes. I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't see the boxes because I don't. I don't read the paper in print. And you're probably one of the few people who exclusively view it online. Yeah. Because we're the, 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 such an anomaly that we print up almost 10,000 copies of the Commons every week. Yeah. And the the number of people who read us in print versus the number of people who read us online is... But that's, you know, that's just one piece. You know, I don't see the boxes. Um, but I also, I don't, um, I don't necessarily understand what is happening, um, you know, in, like, in Bellows Falls, in depth, you know, in mm -hmm. some of the uh, different organizations uh, there, what they're undertaking, who the different personalities are, you know, what's going on with their select board. Um, you know, th those things are actually, those things are important. You know, mm -hmm. my, my, my district, mm, so I guess there could be a couple people watching this today, um, you know, but they're pretty isolated, you mm -hmm. know, and, and how, you know, when I think about how do they connect to this conversation and, you know, um, develop a sense of urgency around this, um, you know, I'm not sure. And, and so it's kind of dire for them. And, and I don't know that they have a means of even getting their arms around it. Mm -hmm. So It does come a large part from the support of the, the community. But it, the community also has to have a lot of trust yeah. in, in the product that is being put out. Laura and I worked together uh, years ago during Irene when I worked for the radio station. And there was an emergency meeting that was being held and she had no way of getting the word out and the about the only means that we could do that was by literally driving over there and broadcasting the meeting to half a county that it didn't impact but the idea was that this is the trust that you will get when when you deal with local media and sort of dropping the guard around um you know, protecting and fighting for dollars and, and advertorials and things like that. And uh, not a fan of advertorials, by the way, Randy, just so you know. Um, but <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, I, I understand that as a community, we, we have a responsibility to have some, some unity and, and to work together and recognize that we all are suffering from the same thing. And yeah. that's a downturn in attention and 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 in that detail and but if all of you are spouting the same thing 
gets hard to ignore. I was, you know, that sparks, uh, you know, others have probably had the same idea as you were speaking, is that the, um, the idea about touting uh, our own horns, there could be a whole community strategy combining the various local types of media that we have and having a, having a real campaign about it. You know, here's your local papers, here are your local radio, here's your local, you know, BCTV, support this whole support this whole ensemble mm -hmm. you know th this is where you get to live local this is where you get to connect i know and and lou i'm sure in the audience will back me up at uh, wvew we've we've been around where well, we're radio free battleboro to begin with those are the good old days um but um sometimes it's herding cats Everyone's talented, everyone's got the drive, everyone's got the enthusiasm, but sometimes they're not all pulling the same wagon, which isn't to say that we want to homogenize. You can usually shift that, though, when the wagon starts going under. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the idea of some sort of a joint effort to bring attention to what we do locally, I think... And I think what needs to, to emphasize that it benefits the community because, mm -hmm. you know, I got another story here about a research without watchdogs, government costs go up. Mm -hmm. That's some of the newest research there. So it benefits the community, the tax base, the um, bond ratings are improved when you have local media keeping an eye on things. Um, in the interest of time, we need to wrap up the panel discussion and go to question and answer. Before we do that, though, I just want to remind folks that um, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table. We're hoping to have future conversations. So if you would like to be involved in those in any ways, please make sure we have your contact information. Also, CORE wanted me to ask on BCTV's behalf if you would reach out to her if you have any thoughts or ideas on what you would like to see in a future news program um, on BCTV. Because uh, you all may be aware that um, Olga's show and Fish's and Chris's show, Green Mountain Mornings, has Pretty been steep. our news show. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Steve's show um, <laughs> has been um, has been BCTV's news show. So that that's how we pull together uh, the ultimate uh, collaboration of local media, where we had the Reformers, mm -hmm. we had the Commons, we had WKVT and BCTV all working together um, for a show that put um, the news on the air for um, Tuesdays and Fridays. So we are looking to maybe replace that show. Um, now that it's ended, and uh, if you have any ideas, we'd be really open to hearing those. So th this is this is, uh, forgive me for, for using this platform to to propose this, but this is precisely what I'm talking about, and this is the moment that we should seize, that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people here that can fill those shoes. And if you pulled in somebody from VEW, and if you pulled in somebody from the Reform, and if you pulled in somebody from the Commons, that you could create this thing in your own studio setting, shooting it and doing it, and doing the, the precise thing that I'm talking about, where you you come in, and then um, and if, if if Melanie can get her newspaper, and and I now also work for a different uh, commercial entity, um, that we would support that effort. And that's the unity I'm talking about. Now, whether that's through promotional, whether that's through, you know, I, you can't, I can't promise fundings. They're not my purse strings. But I can, I can say that we can promote it somehow and, and have this unity feeling, which is always the thing I tried to create at that other radio station mm -hmm. that I'm no longer at. Thank you. Um, I want to turn it on over to question and answer. If you have a question, please come up to the mic. You may not hear your own voice amplified, but it's for the folks who will be watching it on TV. Maybe so. we have to go with this lady first. Okay. <laughs> and, and please just say your name for the sake of everyone present. Hi, I'm Elizabeth McLaughlin. Um, I noticed, I think... You guys are a lot of inside baseball, but a lot of it is um, a reluctance because of that differentiation between um, asking for money or marketing and editorial. You do need a united uh, campaign to ask both individuals and, and businesses for money. I know a lot of you, like I'm a subscriber to The Reformer, but a lot of these groups just ask for businesses and if i don't know that there's a individual sponsorship that you have but you should have it and you should ask because 
if we don't know, we don't know. Uh, but also, it was not clear to me at all in this discussion what happened to Green Mountain Morning, and is there some way that we can ask for its return? Uh, that was not clear to me at all. I know, for example, I've written a letter to the FCC about BCTV, but what happened with Green Mountain Mor Mornings is a mystery to me. Sure, sure. Um, anyone want to jump on the ask part first? Or, or are you just going to take that in as advice? <laughs> we'll just take that in. Okay. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so just very briefly, Green Mountain Mornings, uh, WKVT uh, parent company, Saga, has decided to take the show off the AM signal. So it's off the air. Um, it may exist in the future in another format. They may bring it back as a, as a podcast. I don't know. They made that offer to me for many reasons. I um, it didn't work. Um, but yes, uh, from what my managers told me, the show wasn't making its numbers, and they felt that the bottom line would be served better by by um, taking all the talk shows off 14:90 a.m. and um, 100.3 FM. What's and turning now? turning one into country music and one into uh, easy listening. Country music on AM signal. Mm, yummy. So, so <laughs> you can write to. Um, we can have them write to Ed Christensen. I actually have a Christian, series of emails. Sorry, Ed Christian. Yes. Ed Christian. Ed Christian yes. He's the CEO of Saga. It's a publicly traded. Well, here, so you can actually tell them. Well, yeah, tell everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, Saga is the owner of the station, and they run about 200 different um, local stations across the country, and the man's name is Ed Christian. Um, I think if anyone would like to email him, his email is echristian at sagacom.com. And if you would like Green Mountain Mornings to stay on the air, you should go ahead and let him know. Um, right now he said the termination was irrelevant and uh, he, he wasn't a very nice person when I talked to him. He didn't really have a reason, um, but he said they weren't making numbers, and so maybe we need to help them make numbers. Um, would you repeat the email address? Oh, yes, I would love to, I would love to repeat the email address. It is e Christian E-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N, at sagacom.com. He's the CEO of Saga. So, Olga, I, I want to grab Elizabeth's question, even though I'm not one of the people that sure, needs the funding to keep my program on the air. Um, <laughs> but I think she makes a great point, which is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And um, one of the um, beliefs that I have is when you, money is often actually not the problem. Hmm. There usually is money if you have a clear articulation um, of the problem that you're trying to solve and a plan for how you think you can get there. Uh, then when you go and look for resources, it, it's easier. Thank you. Thank That's you for my that work. thought. So. Um, uh, uh, hi, David Blistein. Short of it here. Um, I don't like the word stakeholders, but this is a really narrow demographic you have here, and I don't want to apologize to anyone on the audience, but the question is, what do the, arti uh, the artists on Elliott Street want to know. What do they want to know? What information do they want? What, where are the big companies? Where, where, where are the people that work at CNS want to know? Um, the Stone Church seems to be busy all the time. I suspect, I don't dare say this, but few of us have been to the Stone Church. There are a lot of constituencies in this town that, well, if they don't want information, then there is no reason for all of us. So I think that's really something we have to focus on, something as a representative, what do your, all, you know, all the constituencies need to know? What are the right-wingers in town need to know? There probably aren't enough of them here. So that's what I would focus on, is what information is needed, and then start thinking about how you're going to get it to them. It's like going back to the beginning. It's Ben Franklin time. Okay. Thank you. I, can, I should just mention uh, very quickly along that line, I know that BCTV anyway, uh, every time the, the contract comes up for renewal is done 
extensive, uh, you know, interviews and, uh, you know, meetings to try to determine what it is that the constituencies that are watching the TV, you know, want to know. I think it's an excellent <coughs> point. It's got to be ongoing and constant feedback loop type thing. Yeah. And George Carville, I'll flip what you just said. It's not so much what the constituency that's watching BCTV needs to know. It's the constituency that's not watching BCTV. They're the ones that hold, I think, the answer to how you improve things and how you get more audience. You don't, you don't need the audience you already got, right? True. Uh, second thought about, the, about the, uh, the radio station, maybe you all need to take a page from what happened with the reformer and get local control back. But what I actually stood up to say was that there's a missing, with possibly one exception, there's a missing constituency here tonight. Anybody here advertise in the reformer? I mean, I know the latches does. That's okay, two. You need to be talking, I think, bringing into the conversation the advertisers on all the media to find out what is working for them. Now maybe you find out that what happens on the radio station helps them. But maybe you find out that they're reaching, they're reaching customers. They're spending money to get people to come into their stores, all right? You may find out that they've got other avenues that they're spending their money on to get people to come into their stores instead of spending it on you. And maybe bring them into the conversation. Bring the local advertisers into the conversation. That's, that's my suggestion. Thank that's you. That's actually a good point. Is that Chris? No, okay. I'll let Chris <laughs> yeah, anyway. uh, Chris Lenoir, I'm actually the, the board president for Brattleboro Community Television, and great job, uh, everybody here organizing this and, and being part of it, including on Facebook Live. And we have a couple of questions coming from oh, Facebook great. Live oh, cool. that have been part of the conversation here, and I kind of wanted to share them as well as react to them and get, get the panel's reaction or anybody who wants to react. And one uh, question just came up about, is there a local media collaborative, a group, of media like this that gathers monthly or quarterly to address these issues, how to collaborate. I think that was sort of just discussed here. And I think the last time this many media members were in a room was on a panel that I moderated uh, <laughs> that Martin Langeveld put together, and that was back in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has to happen more than every 15 months, I think, in order for it to be effective. Um, but it does remind me of something actually that we've been talking about and, and something you touched on, Jim, and it takes me back to a time when I was working in uh, the ski industry and Mount Snow was purchased by a new owner. And at the time, all the different ski resorts actually in Vermont were owned by one conglomerate and they all broke up. And I remember having a conversation with the owner about it. And he made a really interesting point that I never thought about before when he said, well, we're not competing against Killington. We're not competing against Okemo. We're competing against other forms of entertainment for people who want to come skiing. We need to make winter sports appealing and then everybody wins. And I think a similar kind of mindset mm. could be applied to something mm -hmm. like local media. Now the other question that came up much earlier in Facebook and actually started a pretty robust discussion in the comments section uh, had to do with something, uh, Melanie, you brought up before about people wanting to access the articles free mm -hmm. online. And somebody asked about, doesn't advertisers pay for those resources? It's not like we are consuming extra ink and paper from a thousand miles away with our interest in Brattleboro. How does me reading an article on Facebook costing the reformer more than me not reading it? Um, leaving aside for a second the cost of streaming and IT and computers <laughs> and, and all those sorts of things that probably cost as much as if not more than ink and paper. I, I think that, and this gets back to one of the first questions you asked Olga about what needs to change, and I think it's a mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think that mindset is that somehow media is independent of the local landscape. Uh, we are part of your, your local consumer, you know, subscribing to a paper, you know, paying to be a member of the commons or paying to have a subscription to the reformer or advertising in it, you are spending your dollars locally to support local businesses in many, many ways. Not just those local businesses, but all the other local businesses who advertise in those uh, publications or through radio or underwriting on TV. And if any, you want to react to those things? Well, I mean, that's, that's what you're yeah. describing. It's also something that VPR and NPR are past masters at, which is, you know, send us money because we are you and you are us, you know. And, and I do think that idea of a local collaborative is great. And I think the 
um, you know, the, there are passive consumers. I was speaking about this before. How do you use the media? And I think it's, it's a very legitimate question for someone to ask, why can't I just read an article on, you know, online, which I think is perfectly fine. But I think that it's the, it's the, but it's the mind also taking in the fact that I'm a participant in media and I need to contribute however I can to keep it going and not just be a consumer of free media. And I, I'm not, you know, yeah, I just think it's important. Well, my, my answer to that was they're getting free re resources that other people are paying for. That doesn't seem fair. Well, yeah, That's but I think it's really got to be a matter of not so much a matter of, you know, someone's right, someone's wrong, and more a matter of uh, more a matter of activism in consuming media, mm -hmm. understanding what your role is not only as a purveyor, but as an aud auditor, as an audience member, your role in that whole communication. Another, another thing is to point out, you know, how, how these resources could go away. <laughs> like I saw uh, on Facebook a comment where somebody said, well, you know, that we're writing about the FCC issue and they're saying, well, that's OK if it's not on BCTV videos or not on cable. I'll just watch the select board video online. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, no, there will no, be nobody there. No recording video, it. <laughs> folks. Yeah. So um, I think there's also, mm -hmm. you know, the awareness even in our supporters. And like George was saying, we should be, reach, you know, it's the non-BCTV viewers, but also the viewers that may not realize that um, this is a finite resource right. that's just right. no longer going to be there. Right. And that you'll have to find out what happens at that select board meeting by reading the minutes or, or attending or, the or meeting. Attending. Yeah. And, and, I, you know, and I do think also this also does have to come back, as so much does, to, uh, to political activism. Because so, so much of what we're seeing, is, again, this, this jettisoning, this decoupling, all right, whatever your thoughts are about the political process, part of it is, um, you know, is exerting local pressure politically with who we elect, what our, you know, what our values are, you know, in terms of saying, look, we must keep local media alive. It's got to, we cannot simply stand by and allow conglomerates to, you know, to decouple us and to condense into a big city and leave the, you know, the margins un untended and alone. And I think that's an important part of our... I'm going to jump in because I see there's a question, and I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So if you want to get up to the mic, now's a good time to do that. I'm, I'm George Harvey. I have a show on BCTV. Um, we are, we've just done our 298th uh, edition of Energy Week, and the show is um, pretty narrowly focused on energy and climate change. I also write for Green Energy Times. And I write for Clean Technica, and I keep a daily blog. Um, my focus is very narrowly on energy, as I said. One of the things that's occurred to me in the last few days is that we're going to have to deal with climate change without, without the permission of the federal government. And I think this is an analogy to what's going on here. And it, it basically comes down to how are we going to wor live in this world? And the, the, the problem of the community has been a serious problem across the United States for decades. We've seen town after town after town destroyed. Um, I remember Greenfield, Massachusetts having a really big downturn because the Main Street uh, merchants uh, all suffered when a, when a shopping mall came in. That, that is just a repeat of things that have been going on. At the top of this whole thing, which is where the FCC works, they want the control to be in Washington, D.C. Where we are, we want the control to be in our kitchen. And what we've got to do is, is take that control, because we can. We can, we can do that. The, and it, it's climate change, energy, anything you want to talk about. Well, here we're talking about individuals in a community. And the question is, how are you going to make your, your life in the community as fun as it can be, as exciting as it can be, as good as it can be, as comfortable as it can be, as healthy as it can be? And the way to do it is to focus on the community. In order to do that, we're going to have to have community media. Now, I've talked about the media that I work with. I have a blog. I work for uh, uh, Clean, Clean Technica, which is a nationwide, worldwide, actually, uh, organization. Green Energy Times, it's a local to Vermont and New Hampshire 
uh, publication, uh, but it's a print publication. And um, my, my television show, I'm kind of in the middle of everything here. What I see is we can have healthy communities if we have healthy leadership that is concerted at the level of trying to make healthy communities. And if the media, and here it is right here, decides to do that, well, one of the reasons why Brattleboro is a fun place to live is because we've had that in the past. And one way to guarantee that it remains a fun place to live is to continue it in the future. And, you know, it, I think that the idea of people collaborating, media people collaborating, is, is really good. One of the things that I'd mention, though, is if you need money... And I, I appreciate the fact that maybe that's not where it is. It's, maybe it's not money. Maybe it's you, if you've got a plan, the money's going to come. But if you need money, you don't need to get it from the government. You don't need to get it from um, a, a private enterprise. You can crowdfund. And I'll just give you one example. A small community in the Netherlands decided that it wanted to have its own electricity so it allocated a place in the community, within the community, for a single wind turbine. And they crowdfunded that wind turbine. It cost one and a half million dollars. And they had it completely paid for in 24 hours. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cassandra Holloway. I'm a Brattleboro resident, but I'm also the director of the Brattleboro Air Prevention Coalition. I have used all of you um, and you <laughs> to get our message out. I think um, a conversation with nonprofits would be huge because we are, uh, it's very uh, reciprocal. Um, I think are very dependent. Um, we depend on our local media to get our messages out. Um, it's quirky how our funding works. Uh, usually we have to put it into a membership or advertisement um, so we can't necessarily get a donation request and donate money. Um, but we would be very much hurting nonprofits if we lose our way to communicate with our communities. So um, we're actually going to be on Olga's show on Friday <laughs> yeah. to talk about a vaping uh, event for um, parents. And that would have been really great to be able to let parents know that there is this education around vaping and youth. Um, and now we don't have that. Um, so yeah, so I think a conversation with nonprofits, especially the ones that you've actively worked with, and figuring out how um, we can work together. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, um, Martin Langeveld. I uh, came to Brattleboro in 2006 to become um, publisher of The Reformer, and I did that for a couple of years until 2008, which is kind of when the bottom started dropping out of the the whole newspaper business, and it's still sort of you know, <coughs> on that on that same uh, decline. Um, I'm also I've been very happy over the last few years to be involved with the group that uh, uh, of local owners down in the Berkshires who who uh, bought this group of papers, and and I and I'm uh, uh, doing some consulting for them, and I'm on the board of that company. Um, in between, I did a lot of thinking and a lot of um, original, early on, a lot of blogging um, about the sort of new models for news, and uh, and I and I followed a lot of the sort of national trends and thinking uh, that was being uh, written about that subject, and it seemed early on that um, that there were really we were going into a fragmentation of attention rather than you know people sitting down and reading their morning newspaper they were starting to look at you know 10 different things and, and online sources and Facebook of course didn't help that at all what we're seeing now is kind of a swing to the pe of the pendulum back to attention to single um, or a few uh, 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 news sources for people. It's being called the water cooler effect. And the reason it's happening is that if you live in a community like this, or any community, or the larger you know, national community, um, y you, you need to know what's going on because 
if you're going to have your your water cooler conversations, if you're going to talk to people at lunch or, <coughs> or at dinner, there's a shared experience in a community that you you need to be part of. And we've kind of swung away from that and we're swinging back to it. So I think that's important. I think that's one of the things that's, that's helping uh, rebuild circulation for some uh, newspapers, the, the Reformer and the other papers in this group are doing well, particularly on digital subscriptions. Uh, the New York Times is, is, you know, doing hugely well on digital subscriptions, and the, I think the national, um, uh, sort of the national political uh, atmosphere has contributed to that, and, and uh, the Washington Post and other papers seeing that same effect. I think on a local level, what we really can do, and I want to um, second uh, things that several people have said about collaboration and what I think George said about putting together a sort of a, a, a monthly uh, uh, cabal, if that's what we're going to call it, <laughs> um, to, to work down, down in the basement. Remember? To work on that, <laughs> you know. As, uh, no, there's a lot of mold in this basement. As Chris said, I, I organized a few, a few um, sessions at the River Garden over the last few years to to bring the same sort of group of media together to talk about um, the state of things. And, and every time it was, yeah, you know, we should collaborate more. Well, you know, the, the days of trying to get the scoop uh, and beat the next guy to the story, you know, are over. We can do so much more if we collaborate and cooperate and say, you know, how do we all take an issue Pick the issue, doesn't matter where you start, and, and, and address this together. Imagine, you know, a set of stories that run in both of the newspapers and on the radio station and on um, uh, uh, BCTV and, and, and wherever. Um, the impact that that has and the, the, the way that that affects the water cooler uh, effect, the, the, the kind of buzz that you would generate and and having that just having that kind of attention to all the media strengthens all the media and you know so the, what the business plan for this group of new owners has been we'll make the papers better and that'll bring in more readers if we have more readers that'll bring in more advertisers it's pretty simplistic but it's working but imagine how much better it would work for everybody if we said well Let's do just one thing all together and see how much more attention we all get and how much more, you know, reader revenue and advertiser revenue would flow from that. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, do you have one? We really need to get some quick. Okay. Oh, I wanted you to comment. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. So, uh, there's a thousand things, but I'll say these few things. One, to focus on the positives, let's acknowledge there are 12,000 people in Brattleboro, 45,000 in Wyndham County. Look at the media presence we have. Mm -hmm. This isn't real kind of anywhere else in the country. We're a unique and unusual community. And for that reason, I'll, I'll underscore so it's made clear, a pile of us are saying, collaborate, come together, find the strengths that are common. I have always dreamed of, when I was on the board at BCTV, I thought, VEW, BCTV, come together, work it together, budget together, do it together. And the more collaborating, the better, because we're a community that can really support this. The other thing I'll say is this, this dependency model on big evil corporations, <laughs> Comcast, what? You know. <laughs> This sort of dependence, like, please, sir, please don't make us die, it has to end. We're a community that supports things in wholly different ways. Co-ops, cooperatives of all kinds. We can find ways to make this occur. This is not a rich community, but we show up. We give more money than we have all the time. We'll show up if the product is there, and I think the product can be there, because you guys are genius in so many levels. I mean, you support up at the state house, no question. But we have a lot of talent in this area. Look at this room. It's full of people, current and former media people. There's a lot of strength here. If we can actually grab what we're good at and bring it together on a different model, we're seeing, last thing I'll say, 
we're seeing, we're caught in the grips of a paradigm shift. Let's face it, I mean, old stuff, rotary phones are over, sorry. You know, a lot of things are changing. There's no one in this room. Well, there are maybe some young people in this room, but how about somebody sub 30? You know, like, this needs to be part of the conversation. So we need to be looking at this not just as, how do we put, you know, band-aids on things, but how do we change the model and make it work from the strengths that we already have? Yeah. So that's it. Thank you so much for everyone who came out tonight. Thank you to everyone who, oops, I have to look at that camera, who is watching online or will be watching this later on BCTV. Um, thank you to the panelists, you. Jim Maxwell, Melanie Winters, Laura Sibelia, Randy Holhut, Cord Trowbridge. Woo! Everyone who knows I'm bad at names should be very impressed with that at the moment. Um, and just personally, I want to thank everyone who came out tonight because while Green Mountain Mornings may be gone, for now, who knows, um, it was a job I absolutely loved. I loved the community conversations. I love the variety of community conversations. So thank you for indulging me tonight and letting me have a little mini um, panel session to share with you all. So Maybe not thank the you. Last. Maybe not the last. One last thing. This was the first of many conversations. If there's anyone out there who had a question but they weren't comfortable asking it, uh, you can reach out to anyone here with your question um, or leave it on the BCTV uh, Facebook Live or on the event page that um, invited you all to this event because we may use those questions in future conversations. Thank you. Thank you.